Hi, my name is Sue Savage Rumba. I'm the chairman of the Bonobo Hope International uh, Nonprofit, and I'm working for understanding and communication between humans and uh, non human apes. And I think the way to get there is through language. What do you think anthropology is? <laughs> what do I think? Oh, anthropology is yeah. the study of the science of the mind, the behavior of human beings, and it differs from psychology in that psychology which was my field of training thinks that the mind resolves just here <laughs> mm -hmm. right here mm -hmm. and that here if we change everything here we'll change everything out there anthropology thinks we're all netted together and intertwined and that we become that way very early and that we establish a lens through which we through which all of us that are in here look out there and that happens so early that we're unaware of it and because we're unaware of it if we never study it we can't do anything about it yeah. so it's very important that we understand who we are and that's really what that's the deep question of anthropology the difference between psychology and anthropology there is that psychology looks just at individuals or, or psychic states, whereas the anthropologist well, wouldn't get cultural psychology, psychology is defined as the study of the mind. Mm -hmm. But the mind is a creation from the time the infant is born mm -hmm. of the interaction between the mother and the infant, the mm -hmm. other uh, people in the society. Mm -hmm. It's a constant inter interaction. So mm -hmm. you're always trying to figure out your relationship to the other. So with, with that said, what then is primatology? Well, primatology is a strange entity because it's built around the species. Mm -hmm. It's not built around, like everything else, uh, 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 an, uh, it's not a discipline. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not an entity that focuses on like the group like psychology does or the whole cultural milieu like anthropology does or the economics mm -hmm. or the mind. Uh, it focuses on an order, a family, mm -hmm. the family primates. What would you say your work is? I worked on language, but I'm not a linguist. My initial interest was in nonverbal communication, because nonverbal communication can be linguistic. I can go, hmm, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a linguistic comment if you're a human. Uh -huh. every single raise of the brow. Or, so if you're a linguistic organism, you don't just have to have language, but you have to have a concept of self that is thinking about the self and is thinking about other selves and that is giving messages to other selves. So my function has been to understand language and to understand language before it takes a form like I and you are using right now, where we're sitting down just on face in a conversation, we have really nothing around us and mm -hmm. all the information is flowing through our, our vocal expressions. Mm -hmm. When you begin with a child or you begin with a chimp, you, you can't begin at that level. Mm -hmm. You've got to begin at a much more interactive mm -hmm. level. So in trying to understand how you bring language into being in an organism that initially I thought didn't have any language. Mm -hmm. I set out to understand really what language, what language is from the perspective of how one brings it into being through interaction. And you taught language to bonobos. I, I found a way to teach language to bonobos. From that background, I went on to, uh, develop really, I, I would call it a new view of what language is and how language comes to be and how we use language. What would you say language is then? It's, it's a means of sharing one's uh, states, thoughts, and feelings with other living creatures and mm. beings so that behavior can be uh, coordinated. Mm -hmm. Communication is basically coming from a musical perspective mm. and that we humans have kind of separated the emotional aspect of communication from the informational aspect of communication. Mm -hmm. And normally, naturally, they go together. And when they, when they 
are perfectly aligned and put together that the actual sound of the emotional expression, the pitch, the tone, uh, the rhythm, the uh -huh. syncopated rhythm that sometimes comes in, like you can see it in poetry, but it's there in all language, uh -huh. all human language, that that will be understood as a tremendous force in language, which when it impacts other humans, it resonates in their brain in a different way than just the information. Mm -hmm. And when you put that together properly with the information, you don't really have, you don't really have misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. We have misunderstanding because we've highly intellectualized and highly informationized communication and we've divorced it into text. You can have language without text. Mm -hmm. And so to use text as a definition of language has confused us. I've shown that bonobos can learn human symbols. Mm -hmm. I've shown that bonobos can learn human syntax. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, everybody asks, why don't you study their natural language? Mm. And I, I tried to do that more than I tried to teach them natural symbols. I, okay. <laughs> I really tried hard and I'm still working on it because I'm convinced that they do have a language mm. and that uh, Kanzi was able to understand it because he was young and if I had been a baby, I might have been able to understand Matata, mm -hmm. but I wasn't a baby. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of what was happening was happening in the first three years of life. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's already been anthropological data to show that in humans, it's the first three years of life that you really, I wouldn't say you learn all of the culture, but you become enculturated to the extent that you are a member of that culture and mm -hmm. everything else is, comes to you through the lens of that culture. And it's not really possible to easily look through the lens of another culture once, once you've had that first three years it, mm -hmm. it uh, and it's a it's especially a function of what happens with language mm -hmm. so because Kanzi had both myself and my sister and Matata as all kind of aunts and mothers so to speak mm -hmm. and he he spent time each day with 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 bonobos and with humans and sometimes with bonobos and humans together mm -hmm. he just became bicultural right. and he could understand the language in either group we could not understand Matata. Matata could not understand us. Kanzi just thought it was all the same. And then he would try to talk to us and he would use what was English to him, but it came through a bonobo vocal track. So it was difficult uh -huh. to understand it, but we could understand some words like right now, it was always, I am, I am. Mm -hmm. So you could, mm -hmm. you know, you could understand that. You heard it quite a bit. Yeah. And he could use the keyboard to make words clear, and he could use some signs that he learned to make words clear. Mm -hmm. So if we were to continue this cross-culturally, I might be able to learn bonobo language. I can say that when I would spend long periods of time, even sleeping with the bonobos, especially sleeping with the bonobos, because your brain sort of mm -hmm. casts out the human things. Mm -hmm. And when I would be really tired or just had just woken up, before I got fully into mm -hmm. any human mode and I hadn't really spoken any human language, mm -hmm. I, I could understand the bonobos. I, as an experimenter, tried to demonstrate to the linguistic community and to the behavioral psychology community that yes, what Kanzi was doing was really what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think I pretty much succeeded that Kanzi had those capabilities mm -hmm. with, a, with a learned, acquired language. What do you think it means to be human in, in that light, right? That was my initial question. Once mm -hmm. I understood the theory of evolution and uh, I understood the theory of acquired behavior from the lens of psychology, and I had begun to understand it through the lens of anthropology, I felt like we really need to understand how we become who we are. Mm -hmm. We really need to do that because as soon as we do that, we can build a really good society. But <laughs> if we don't understand it, we're just going to keep having these same problems over and over and over. So I was mm -hmm. driven by that as a graduate student. One of my first jobs was to work with Lucy, who had been raised from the day of birth in a human home mm -hmm. and never had seen another chimpanzee. Mm. And I spent half a day with her 
And then I spent half a day with this group of mothers and infants, mm -hmm. uh, five mothers who were raising their infants together in a mother infant group of chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And so the, the difference was astonishing. But at that time, Lucy was said not to have any language and mm -hmm. Roger was teaching her a few signs. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've learned since that point by, by taking what I knew about the social behavior of natural chimpanzees, what happens when you have a chimpanzee in a human environment and putting that together mm -hmm. in a bonobo environment where you're so fortunate in that you have a mother that was raised until puberty in a real wild bonobo group mm -hmm. and almost no captive mother they're they're all brought in as babies or they're raised in nurseries or by mothers who didn't know how to raise them so mm -hmm. what we know in captivity when you read these articles they're mostly totally wrong mm. because they because they've lost their chimp culture they've lost their chimp culture and they've tried to put something in its place and they've done fairly well but it's to me it's rudimentary compared mm -hmm. to what i see in the wild mm. So when you understand how far they can go, how much they can learn, it changes the equation. It changes, it changed for me how I even wanted to ask what was human. So what I have come to conclude is very, it's really very simple. I, I think that we have a higher, longer capacity we're producing patterned movements, patterned sounds, patterned movements with our fingers, patterned movements with our body. And when we put sounds together in long, rapid, phonemic utterances, when you begin to do things over and over, they get chunked. Language gets chunked. Everything gets chunked. And Kanzi seems to have a fairly good ability to remember things I say as long as they're all within a schema. Mm -hmm. But if you start to say things like, Kanzi, I want you to do X and Y and Z and D, you know, he's like, well, that's too many. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but if I want you to do X so then you can do Y, which makes sense. So then we can go to location S because Liz wants us to. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, I got that. Mm. You know, so that's syntax, but it's also syntax with sense. Mm -hmm. So he can chunk. He can take in very complex things, but we seem to have more of ability to focus our attention for a longer period of time on a wider variety of things. Mm. So that's a kind of, I feel like that is a sort of fundamental difference, which I was never in a position. I never had the funding to actually test that. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be tested. As soon mm -hmm. as we get competent linguistically, our world becomes a linguistic world. Mm -hmm. And we begin to imagine roles and how we're going to interact with each other. And we begin to relate the future to the past. And we begin to ask for causal justification and causal reasoning for every action. Why did you do that? Within what moral framework are you doing that? I'm certain that apes are able to do that. Mm. They have that ability to build language to that level and then look back at society. Mm -hmm. Not, hmm. They don't do it, I'm sure, in the same kind of way that we do it because Matata didn't do it in the same way that Kanzi and, pa Kanzi and Pamanisha could switch between Matata's way of doing that and our way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And Matata's way of doing that always involved utterances that were about we, we think this, we feel that, we want this, we like mm. this, what are we doing? So it was, there had to always be a we in uh. Matata's world. <laughs> wow. Kanzi and Pamanisha could step into the we or out of the we and look at the we. So if you weren't part of the we, Matata didn't like you. Huh. So you had, you as a human, I had to negotiate that. And Kazi Pamanisha could negotiate it really easily. But, but because they could negotiate either way, I think Matata could have, but she was raised in a bonobo culture. Where there's only we. Well, there's a little teeny me. 
<laughs> it's there, but it's little, and it's it's culturally not right to think about it a lot because we <laughs> are going to survive together, or we are going to die. So if you're just focused on you, that's not you're not really a good bonobo. Right. You know, you're not really okay. There's some little screwy with you. <laughs> That was how Matata looked at it. So, so bonobos have that capability, but when it comes to thinking about the past, the future, the we, where we're going to go, what we're going to eat, how we, how we feel about each other, and also tools and making tools and making fire, the local legends are that the bonobos chose not to do that. They chose not to focus on those things. Mm -hmm. not to carry their tools with them, which they made, and to put their fires out. Mm -hmm. That this was a decision so that they could live a way of life that was embedded in nature. The local legend, whose legend? The legends of the people that live with the bonobos. They say they used to live in the forest with the bonobos, and humans and bonobos lived together. They cared for each other. They could understand each other's language. Huh. And they were brothers. They were brother species. In Wamba, they don't kill bonobos or eat bonobos uh -huh. because they think they're uh, they think they're partly human. They think they're our brothers. That they're right. an alternative form of human that's uh -huh. made a choice, and that big choice was not to keep their fires going, mm. to let their fires go out when it rained. And humans began to build huts over their fires to keep them going when mm -hmm. it rained. And then you have to bring everything to your hut if you're mm -hmm. trying to keep your fire going. And you can't just follow the forest. Right. And it was, it was so interesting because I didn't know any of those things when I began to work with Kanzi. And when I began to just sort of do things that were fun in the forest, like make a fire, Kanzi just became fascinated huh. with how to make a fire. And he became fascinated with the movie Quest for Fire. And he must have watched it a thousand times or more. Oh, my God. He would just watch it over and over and over, and then he would go practice fire making. But Kanzi would always let his fires go out. Huh. He's not interested in keeping them going you know, <laughs> or keeping rain off of them. And then I go to Wamba and I hear this legend, and I'm like, well, I, that's what I found to be true in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> now, did Matata give Kanzi this information? Did she tell him that? I mean, I don't know. Just the way you couldn't really understand human culture unless you immersed yourself in it. Uh -huh. uh, the same is true. It, it's just one step more. It's be, it's one small step beyond uh -huh. human culture. But, yeah. but because the vocal track is a little different, you really need to have this early exposure of your brain uh -huh. to listening to these sounds because the first thing a brain does is it calls something language or not language. Uh -huh. And if it calls it language, it puts it in this whole set of processors that look at meaning and context and everything. Uh -huh. Otherwise, it calls it a sound. The language is the key. The language is the key to allowing a person to go into another human culture. Right. The language is the key that's going to allow us to go into a chimpanzee culture or a bonobo culture. And until we seek that and begin to begin to reach out for it, we're, we're just going to have the completely wrong opinion of our closest living relatives, which is never going to help us understand what it is to be human, because we're not, we're not reaching in the right way for the answer to that question.